thanks for coming in, Freddy. I, I heard you got some new eyes recently. Just want to check to make sure that they're all functioning before we send you back out there on the stage. Tell me, what do you see here? That is my friend Bonnie. I miss him. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? How about this one? It's me? Hmm, interesting response with heavy lore implications. Gonna make a note of that one. All right, how about this last one? Oh, that's, uh, that's the DJ, you know. DJ... DJ... Mm-hmm. No, 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 hold on, don't help me, I have this. D DJ... Come on, Freddy, it's obviously... Music Man! Music Man! Oh! Music Man! Music Man! Man! Music Man! I called it! Go, 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 go! Music Man! Internet, welcome to Game Theory, where the only thing that slaps harder than our remixes is you slapping that subscribe button. A huge thank you to Doofix from the Game Theory subreddit for helping that meme achieve its true final form, and for letting me use it as a part of this video. As I write this, his masterpiece only has 400 views, so let's blow that channel up. Link is in the top line of the description, you know what to say. Fill up those comments, let me hear ya. Music Man! As the man said in the song, Let's go! Let's go! 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 Say what you will about Security Breach, and uh, there's certainly a lot you can say about Security Breach. The fact that it launched this weird, unseen animatronic from Pizzeria Simulator into Meme Lord status is perhaps its greatest accomplishment. And, speaking of other unseen animatronics, today's episode is actually a pair of mini-theories all about two animatronics that are notably absent from this newest game. Characters that have been with us since the very beginning of the franchise, but whose 80s shoulder pads apparently weren't big enough for the final cut. And in a game that throws so much Freddy spaghetti against a lore wall to see what sticks, what gets excluded from the game is almost as interesting as what made the final cut. So what are the mysteries surrounding these two animatronics? Can we solve the mysteries? And what do the solutions tell us about the lore of this new game? That, my loyal theorists, is what we aim to answer today. Missing animatronic number one, Glamrock Bonnie. We all thought it was strange when the trailers first dropped and we saw our favorite animatronics in their new 80s getup. Freddy, Chica, Foxy, kind of, and Bot. No, 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 that, that's an alligator. Yep, Montgomery Gator was in, and Bonnie the Bunny was out. At first, I thought this was just gonna be a repeat of Sister Location. Introduce some new characters, reintroduce some old ones with new looks, and, you know, just leave a couple out. But then, right outside of the daycare of Security Breach, we hear this. There is no rabbit at the Mega Pizza Plex. Not anymore. And that right there, my friends, is Theory Bait. Stick it on a fish hook and drop it in the water to reel me in. Clearly, this was more than just an arbitrary swapping of characters. There's a story here, a mystery to solve. Glamrock Bonnie did exist at some point here in the Pizzaplex and now doesn't. And the game continues to remind us of this mystery as we explore them all. While trying to decommission Chica, you have to venture into Bonnie Bowl. And while we're up there, Freddy says this. I do not come up here anymore. I miss him. We even get a collectible message from Roxy Raceway that talks about him. Quote, management report. The bowling alley needs a re-theme. While most of the Bonnie art was removed, kids keep asking, where's Bonnie? Do we have an officially approved response? So yeah, where is Bonnie? The kids want to know, and heck, I want to know what happened to everyone's favorite rabbit. Well, to answer that, we actually have to follow the other messages that we get in the Faz Watch. Specifically, this security alert found behind a locked Monty gate in the game's opening service tunnel. Quote, security report, 1224 AM. Bonnie is seen leaving his green room in Rockstar Row heading east towards the atrium. 2.40 a.m., Bonnie enters the East Arcade. 4.12 a.m., Bonnie enters Monty Golf. Bonnie is wandering around the Pizza Plex and winds up in Monty Gator Golf. And see, this is an important detail because as we see in both the game and the collectible messages, Monty has a bit of a mean streak going on. He likes breaking things. He also has a bit of an ego. I don't know if you noticed, but the animatronics in this game are unusually human compared to the ones that we've seen previously. They have personality, emotions. We see Roxy crying in her room because we've managed to escape her. We should have found him by now. It's not fair. I'm not 
A loser. Chica is just hungry all the time, and Monty wants to be the star. He's looking for a way to rise to the role of leader of the band, singer in the spotlight. We know this thanks to hole number nine of the Gator Golf minigame. Monty is center stage, and Freddy is left out in the dumpster. So when bass player Bonnie comes rolling into his domain late at night, Monty sees this as his opportunity to take him out and become the bass player himself. This is all fairly straightforward just from reading those collectible messages, but it does leave me wondering why. Why did Bonnie go to Monty Golf in the first place? Well, what if someone led Bonnie there so he would get destroyed? Monty would get what he wants, a more prominent role in the band, and Bonnie would be quietly decommissioned and turned to scrap. Scrap that could then be used to help rebuild another rabbit that we're all familiar with. One that's hiding out in the basement. Good old Burn Trap Afton. You want to know where Glamrock Bonnie is? Right there. Right in front of your face. Burn Trap's body is Glamrock Bonnie body. And I'm not just saying that because they're both rabbits, there's actually a couple more clues that pointed me in this direction. If we turn back to when we last saw Afton in the form of Scrap Trap during Pizzeria Simulator and Ultimate Custom Night, there were some interesting design details. Namely, the fact that we can see a lot of bone underneath the suit. A lot of bone. Top of his skull, his jaw, around the eyes here, even the collarbone you can make out in his jump scare. But here in Security Breach, Afton has basically got a whole new body. As Scrap Trap, he was made primarily of bone and muscle, but now he's almost entirely animatronic, with the exception of the weird fleshy tendons that entangle the endoskeleton, as well as the skull, which now appears to be melted into the rabbit face. But we see loads of endoskeletons throughout Security Breach. We even hear Vanessa saying that they could just put old casings onto new endos if they need to. Monty will run the shows until parts and service can slap your casing on a new endo. So why then am I so sure that Burn Trap uses Bonnie's endo when they could have used any other endoskeleton? It all comes comes down to the hands. They make a big point in the trailers to reveal this mechanical hand with claws at the end of its fingers, and they put emphasis on it again during Afton's ending when his hand reaches outside the recharge station. On both occasions, the focus is on Afton's left hand, a hand that was completely missing from Scrap Trap in both FNAF 6 and Ultimate Custom Night. I mean, technically he was missing that entire left arm, but uh, you get the point. So what does any of this have to do with Bonnie? That could be any endoskeleton arm, right? Wrong. Take a look at the Glamrock endoskeletons from this game. Their hands? Yep, they don't have claws. The only animatronic whose endoskeleton does have claws? Montgomery Gator. We actually get a really good look at his hands once we've decommissioned him. But, uh, hold on a minute, I was saying that Burn Trap was made from Bonnie, so why am I so focused on Monty? Well, we have to go back to the messages that we get on our Faz Watch. Down in Parts and Services, we get this maintenance log. Quote, Montgomery's claw upgrades allow him to play the bass. Following performances, he mostly uses them to cause damage. Damage. Before I read this message, Monty having claws didn't really strike me as an odd design detail. I mean, the dude's an alligator. Kind of makes sense. But this message made me reevaluate that opinion. Claws are only for animatronics that play the bass. When we get the message about Bonnie being out of commission, we get this line. Quote, With Bonnie out of commission, we are making Monty the new bass player. Parts and service have already done the proper adjustments. End quote. They're installing the claws on Monty because he's becoming the bass player, which means that Bonnie before him must have also had claws. They need to be built into the endoskeleton because they have to pluck the heavier strings. Therefore, the claws on Afton's new body prove that they could have only come from a single source, Glamrock Bonnie. But Glamrock Bonnie isn't the only one conspicuously missing from the security breach lineup. Where is everyone's favorite yellow clickbait, Golden Freddy? At first, I didn't think too much about his absence. Last we saw old Yellow Fredbear, he was twitching away at the end of Ultimate Custom night, keeping the spirit of Afton trapped in an endless purgatory of torment. Meanwhile, you got old man consequences over here asking Cassidy, you good bro? And encouraging them to leave the demon to his demons. So, yep, that story seemed largely done. Cassidy, aka the one you should not have killed, aka the vengeful spirit, call the kid whatever you want, this was another playing piece off the lore table. The end of another character arc. So why would Cassidy appear in Security Breach? Doesn't seem necessary. But then, it was more Freddy Spaghetti time. Security Breach once again threw everything it had at the wall to see what stuck. And I do mean everything they had. Basically everyone and everything in the series up to this point is represented somewhere in this game. FNAF 1 animatronics, FNAF 2 animatronics, tons of references to FNAF 4, a direct connection back to FNAF 6, there's Baby, there's the Puppet, there's the Fun Times. If my theories up to this point have been correct too, you also get Crying Child Michael and Elizabeth, the Aftons all in one neat little pack 
package. And that's still not all. The arcade cabinets reference everything from the original novel trilogy to the Fazbear Fright stories. Heck, in this one game, you get not only one, but two. Count them two versions of William Afton. Glitch Trap and Burn Trap. You have all the versions of pretty much all the important characters throughout the franchise. So in a title that seemingly references every other important corner FNAF lore, where's our golden boy Freddy? Well, he's there. He's hiding in plain sight. Right here. Inside the Princess Quest arcade games. The princess is, quite literally, Golden Freddy. Or, to be entirely accurate, it's actually the spirit of Cassidy inside the arcade game. I know! It seems crazy, right? And while I could try to bury the lead here and string this whole thing out, I'm not. There's just too much to talk about. We know that this is Golden Freddy because it's coming straight out of the horse's mouth. I guess it's the sheep's mouth? Because it's Steel Wool Studios? Anyway, if you dive into the game files, there's a character sprite folder labeled Cassidy. Open it up and what do you find? The princess. Now, I gotta be honest, that alone didn't convince me. Sure, it is a huge deal, and obviously the golden color of the princess is a direct connection back to everyone's favorite yellow bear, but this is also a series that's used the name Jeremy in, like, what? At least four separate places? Is that right? Four? He's a missing children's incident kid, he sliced his face off in FNAF VR with a paper cutter, he's a security guard from the FNAF 2 Paychecks, and, oh yeah, he's in the latest Fazbear Frights book. So yep, those are the four instances that I can just remember off the top of my head. So forgive me if I'm in need of a bit more proof here before I call this one confirmed. So I kept digging. First, it's worth noting that in a previous theory, I suspected that the princess was actually meant to be a stand-in for Vanessa. You see, Security Breach isn't the first time that we've actually seen the Princess Quest minigame. It originated as part of the mobile port for FNAF VR when they needed some way of telling Vanessa's story. Instead of finding 16 glitching cassette tapes like you did in the original FNAF VR, the mobile port has you playing Princess Quest 1, lighting 16 braziers to eventually find the layer of glitch trap. Interestingly though, digging through that game's files reveals that the princess character wasn't labeled as Cassidy. This is a new thing for Security Breach, which tells me that this was also an important story element for them. A story that, now that we have all three Princess Quest games to look at, suddenly takes on a different meaning. When you play Princess Quest 1, you're being hunted down by black and glitchy rabbit creatures. These things are clearly working for Glitch Trap, but if that's the case, why would he be sending them to attack you? If the princess is truly meant to be a stand-in for Vanessa finding the tapes, wouldn't he want Vanessa to find them so she comes under his control? Rabbits attacking doesn't make sense. However, if we consider the golden princess to instead be Cassidy, back from the dead once more to try and stop William for good, then of course, Billy Afton would do everything he can to stop the princess. I also think that each princess quest represents a different phase of Cassidy's experience quite nicely. In the first one, Cassidy is helpless, an innocent, helpless child lured to a back room and killed by a monster that looms in the shadows. But by Princess Quest 3, the princess is fighting back. And not just fighting back, but doing it in the same location that we walk through in FNAF VR. Notice the large central stage, the prize corner back behind us, and a rounded side stage to the left. Now, this is an important detail because as we see at the end of FNAF VR, we're playing in the location of the missing children's incident. Glitch Trap lures us to the back room only to shove our dead body into Freddy's suit while he dances around. This is Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, where the initial five kids, including Cassidy, first went missing. Cassidy's story truly comes full circle. Playing through Princess Quest 3 the first time, I also thought it was unusual to have a giant Chica face looming in the background watching us. Like, why? Seriously, why? You don't just do that for decoration. And then I remembered this line from Ultimate Custom Night. <laughs> I was the first, I have seen everything. This means that Susie, the spirit inside of Chica, saw the deaths of everyone else, meaning that she was probably watching as Cassidy was killed. Hence why she, of all the characters, would be the one watching us in this moment. So the file name matches, the color matches, the narrative arc makes sense as we revisit important locations from Cassidy's past, but that's not all. Elsewhere in the files, there's another piece of glitch text, similar to the text that we originally saw when you approach Glitch Trap in Princess Quest 1, but this time it's much shorter. It'd be hard to decipher if we hadn't just decoded Afton's text before, but we did, and using that code we're able to translate these dots as It's Me, the iconic phrase that we've seen every time Golden Freddy has been present throughout the series. Last but not least, Cassidy being here just makes sense with the story. Whenever there's William, Cassidy is close behind, hence the whole vengeful part of vengeful spirit. This is something that we actually see in the Fazbear Frights book, specifically the story The Man in Room 1280. In this story, we get a ruined, burned William Afton dying on a bed, haunted by an angry 
spirit named Andrew with curly black hair wearing an alligator mask. This very clearly is meant to be the book stand-in for Cassidy. In a previous story, Andrew outright says, quote, I do remember wanting to get back at someone who hurt me. I think I attached myself to him. I got into his soul, made sure he couldn't move on when he should have died. I remember I wanted him to suffer the way he made me suffer. Basically, the two are inseparable. Andrew grafted himself onto Afton, and now their souls are mixed. So consider this. Glitztrap was created when a bunch of circuit boards were scanned into a system to create a video game. They sent us that stuff in the first place with no explanation. It was just junk. Circuit boards and things like that. Somehow though, there was usable code on some of it. If Cassidy was truly attached to Afton, then Cassidy's spirit would also likely be in those circuit boards, thereby creating a digital version of her, aka the princess. So yeah, I feel pretty darn confident that that is indeed Cassidy in Princess Quest. Everything I could find backs it up from a design, timeline, narrative sense. Also, the file name suggests that the king is actually old man consequences. Uh, sure, I guess. Leave the demon to his demons. Unless, of course, you want to take my my sword and go ham on him. Anyway, so what does it all mean? Why is this important at all? Well, it gives us a rationale for why playing some random arcade games somehow manages to free Vanessa from Glitch Trap's control. As a reminder, if you play all three Princess Quest games, you get the free Vanny ending, where she turns good and joins you eating symbolic ice cream cones. But really, it's a pretty weird logical leap that playing a few random arcade games somehow gets this young woman free of the virus that's infected her brain. But now, it makes a bit more sense. At the end of Princess Quest 3, we confront a large security door that's covered in purple goo, only to get a blood-curdling scream. <laughs> That goo tells us that it's glitch trap behind the door. It even has a glowing set of eyes on the left-hand side, which, if you squint, kind of looks like a rabbit head. This kind of goo wasn't present in the identical door within Help Wanted, implying that he is now in control. So when Cassidy unlocks the door and goes in, the digital scream that we hear from the other side is glitch trap dying, crying out as Cassidy delivers the killing blow and maybe, hopefully, finally, putting both of their souls to rest. Security Breach, to me, has been this story about endings. Throughout all of my my security breach theories thus far, we focused heavily on the idea of characters coming full circle, giving closure to them and ending their parts within the FNAF storyline. The crying child and the missing children got their closure back in FNAF 3's Happiest Day. Henry and the puppet got their closure in the FNAF 6 ending. If I'm right about my theories, then the rebuilt Afton kids get their closure on the hillside eating ice cream here in Security Breach. And now Cassidy. While all the other dead kids of the series have been able to move on, Cassidy has always remained, always trying to chase Afton down, torturing him in purgatory for what he's done, so driven by anger and revenge that she couldn't let go. So this feels like a great ending to this chapter of the series. Finally, Cassidy gets to join the others and rest, putting aside their agony and putting an end to the Golden Freddy arc, and hopefully to Afton's arc as well. But there's still one more that's incomplete. One more series of secrets in this game that we haven't talked about yet. Tune in next FNAF episode as we wrap up our coverage for Security Breach by talking about the most controversial and frustrating part of it. The retro CDs, the mysterious Patient 46, and what all of that has to do with the theories that we've covered so far. So bite of 87 that subscribe button to ensure that you don't miss it. And as always, remember, it's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. So remember, February 19th, Saturday, for our final Security Breach Theory, and then make sure you stick around after the episode for a live theorist talkback, where me and a bunch of other FNAF theorists from around YouTube get together to discuss all things Security Breach. The good, the bad, the robotic. And we can't wait to hear your thoughts on it as well.